This session's been streamed, um, and just to let you know, it's also been uh, audio recorded as part of the Dub2 Radio uh, podcast that's been running uh, since early 2009. And interestingly enough, that's actually uh, what we want to talk about, which is to hark back to the origins of Gov2O, uh, some of the people that most of you know quite well around Canberra that were part of, uh, in 2009, the early days of Gov2O. Uh, and so what we want to do today is a bit of a, uh, a salute uh, and record this, um, and re record a, a short podcast. Um, so, hi, I'm John Wells from Gov2 Radio. Uh, and we're here to uh, talk about Beyond Gov 2.0 and towards open government and connected citizens. We're going to look at a, uh, the short history of Gov 2.0 since the early days of 2009, some five years. And in that time, we find that uh, things have changed, that Gov 2.0 as a, as a notion, as a, as a tag, is talked about these days a little less in a lot of conferences and forums. Uh, open data, open government is talked about a little more. Some people feel that uh, the, the initial uh, enthusiasm, the initial aspirations of Gov 2.0 uh, about uh, doing better ways of doing government, whether it's from the political perspective, the policy or advocacy perspective, public service delivery, through to citizen participation in democratic processes, that all of that good promise has become actually, uh, for many people in government, talking about, uh, you know, do we have a social media policy? Uh, do we use Facebook and Twitter? And, and what do we not do? So we want to talk today about uh, where we are now and what can we learn that applies to open government uh, and more progressive, connected ways of doing a democratic public sphere. We, and joining us is Craig Tomlin, who's well known has uh, received an international award for uh, recognition for his work in this space. Alison Hornery from Gov2 Radio and James Dello uh, from uh, the Ripple Effect Group. Um, and links and hashtags can be found on the Gov2 Radio episode page. So guys, let me ask you, uh, O'Reilly, uh, Tim O'Reilly, uh, uh, picked up on the Web 2.0 uh, uh, meme in early 2009. Uh, and was there something in the drinking water? Because in 2009, lots of people all around the world, but particularly in the US, Australia, Canada, the UK, started talking about this thing called Gov 2.0. What was the tipping point? What, what do you think it meant to people in those days? Um, look, I think, you know, there was a, obviously all the hubris around Web 2.0, and what we were seeing was amazing, amazing potential for the web to be a platform to do things where it wasn't just a, a page that you went to and, and passively read content. And that probably goes back to you know, Tim Berners-Lee, his, his original idea that the, the internet would be a read-write web, not just a read web. And I think for me, what Gov2O was about was saying, hey, we've got this fantastic online platform. How can we actually use that to transform how we do government? To try and, one, fill in some of the, I guess, uh, gaps of things we can't normally deliver, but also to deliver in a different way. I think for me, well, certainly that, that was my perspective of what people got excited around gov 2 r Maybe in the US it was a different perspective because of their particular form of, of you know, democracy you know, and small government, whereas Australia is a little bit different. But I think that the same issues are the, are the same. Is how can we use this web as a platform to, to fill gaps, but also to do things differently? Yeah, I, I, I tend to put it a little bit in, in revolutionary terms. Uh, I guess... You know, every revolution needs some kind of trigger or, or figurehead or something to focus around. And I think there was already a lot of people who felt that, you know, government was not really grasping these new technologies or using them in an effective way. There was a lot of deep-seated, you know, resentment building even within government agencies where people had come into the public service, they they'd started to grow up with some of these new way of doing things and they wanted to use it in the cause of public good. They wanted to be able to you know, make government more responsive and more effective in how it engaged with citizens. So there was a lot of, I think, pent-up demand where people were looking for a focus. And I think gov 2 came along as, as the particular term at the right point in time to sort of focus all of that sort of interest and demand. 
and uh, also coming off the back of Web 2.0, you know, there, it, it implied something new and different and new ways of doing things. And I think there was very much a thirst for uh, looking at new ways of doing things. Um, and that was sort of the, the, the catalyst that got things started. I think for me, one of, one of the things I'd add, I'd agree with, with both of those, is that almost from the very beginning, it seemed to be very aspirational in nature. Um, that there really was this sense of, you know, there are these tools out here and, and there is the capacity to try some things differently, to do things in new ways and to involve people in a conversation that's much more broad than perhaps, you know, it, it had been possible to have before. So one of the things I think that excited most of the people at the very beginning of this conversation was, was that it was that aspirational, there is, a, you know, a light on the hill kind of thing. Um, you know, whether or not it was driven by mm. the technology, I don't but, know. But the light on the hill has become very much in the last five years a conversation very much about the technology and what you can do with it. Um, do you feel we've, we've missed something along the way? Has the notion of a more connected culture, uh, both within the public service, uh, between government and citizens, and also the, the opportunities for citizens to be more participatory, have we downplayed that a little while emphasising what most people can grasp and understand, which is the, the, the things, the technology? Well, actually, I'll, I'll probably maybe argue a little about this issue around the discussion around technology. I think it's a question, have we had the right conversation around technology? There's been a lot of emphasis, as we've said, about on particular social media channels. Is my government agency on Twitter? Do we have a policy to deal with that? And I think that's, that's the, the wrong question. If we go back to the, the, the original gov to ii idea, and there was a documentary, and I ran out I've um, sort of put together a showing of this documentary called Us Now in 2009, and that was pointing at not necessarily a government example, but a range of examples of saying, how can we do things differently because we have this technology? And I think that's the missing piece in the puzzle. Rather than just incrementally adding another comms channel, what we're not talking about is what are the, the fundamental differences that these technologies enable. And if we look at outside of government, you know, Airbnb, you could not have done that without the web. It just would not happen. There's a lot of ideas around collaborative consumption now. It just would not happen without the web. And of course, just to throw in the interesting yeah. thing is that we're, uh, as we speak, we're approaching the 25th anniversary of the web, and its founder, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, is quite concerned and is starting a campaign uh, just last week around maintaining the open openness uh, uh, of, of the web. Um, so, so in that five years, what's also happened is governments have gotten a little tougher yeah. and a bit more restrictive, actually, about, about the work. Yeah. Um, where are we then in terms of a, a sense of um, government's uh, willingness to be open and collaborative with citizens? Yeah, I, I, I think this is a sort of a hybrid thing that happens when you've got you know, new things that come out. Like, firstly, you know, definitely there has been difficulty with the conversation about the technologies. I mean, a lot of the conversations we hear in government about digitalising things. And actually it's not about digitalising something, which is taking an existing process and replicating it online. It's about actually transforming um, the approach and actually looking at, you know, firstly, whether you should be doing it in the first place, uh, whether you know, it's possible to actually uh, automate or outsource or do things in a very different ways. But the second thing is, is how do uh, you know, web technologies transform the way people can interact with each other and, and govern a country? And I think governments, governments that tend to be very, very strong institutionally, and a lot of the, the goal of government is to maintain status quo. So their goal over a long period of time through periods of civil unrest, technological disruption, ecological disasters, is to try and maintain the line, is to try and be stable. So a lot of pushback has, has occurred with government basically saying, this is what we're here for, this is what we do. Um, the way to break out of that conversation really doesn't come through government, it comes through communities, where the communities start changing the way they engage with government. It can, but the interesting thing is it could be argued that in this country we very much have a culture of looking to government to, to create the framework for the conversation. Um, something that, by the way, is going on right now around things like the Open Government um, Partnership. But, in fact, coming back to the Gov 2.0 Task Force, Australia got a lot of recognition around the world for being an early adopter and setting up that, that task force. And the official line these days is that the Australian Government has essentially ticked all the boxes 
whereas the chair of that task force is somewhat less enthusiastic, you might say. What, what could we have done differently that might have left us in a better place, perhaps? Yeah, I, I think we are somewhat surfing on past glories in that respect. Um, and and uh, I think that will last for some time. I think the biggest thing, and it is happening and it's starting to happen, is that these technologies are becoming normalised in people's lives. And it's only when these things get normalised in people's lives when they start changing the way they do things to adapt to the new ways they can do it. So still, we're still in that transitionary period, and that, and that may last us 20, 30 years. Um, you know, five years in, you're only just being able to grasp you know, what might be possible um, without really having all the decision makers uh, understanding even the changes that have occurred underneath their feet. So I think we, we are very much talking about generational change. And I've always said this about you know, what we're going through at the moment with the internet is, is a paradigm shift in the way human beings interact with each other uh, globally and the way they interact with governments, with uh, companies and with each other. And this does take uh, decades to actually work through the system and actually result in real change. Um, if you look at when the internet started, versus when the web started, versus when we saw you know, the dot .com, first dot .com boom and the second dot .com boom. There were large gaps in that, in that process. It took a long time for each step, and that was just in, across civil society. Government is going to take longer because intrinsically its goal is to hold the line. I, I think that the interesting thing though, it's going to be challenged because that time frame is getting quicker though. Uber, and it's now it's bumping into um, issues of civil society, you know, um, workforce regulation, industrial relations. That's happening very quickly, um, so I think I think maybe time is running out to just wait for a, a decade to happen. We've had actually half a decade since the task force, um, and I think th things outside are moving fast, and that will certainly put more pressure on government. Mm. But I think there's a question whether government, society, wants to be on the front foot, mm. or do they want to wait for someone just to come in? And Which Alex, that that begs the question though. That the, a lot of the examples I've heard you quote mm. around social media, and and for the listeners. I'm using social media now in its broader sense, meaning not just Twitter and Facebook and the like, but what you might call consumer platforms, but all sorts of other collaborative and uh, engagement platforms. Um, some of the, the bet, or most of the best examples tend to be from the commercial world or the private space or the civil society space rather than government. Does go is government fundamentally in Western democracies set up to do social, to do collaborative, to do I think, the, I think the examples that have got scale have tend to come from the commercial sector because the commercial sector looks at the world and says, there's my market. Whereas, I mean, even um, you know, with the presentation about the um, mobile camera, um, you know, it's about ACT. And that's, that's the, all they care about is the ACT, the, the geographic political boundary, um, legal boundary, and no more. Commercial companies will go global. I think there are lots of good examples out there. But I think it's, it's about how much... I, think, I very much look at the Australian context we're adopting ideas, um, but what things haven't, what opportunities are we missing to do things differently? Where we are seeing good examples out there. I mean, one of the things that I'd like to pick up on, picking up on what James was saying, but also the question about, you know, what, what could we have done differently, or what can we learn from from the task force exercise and the, and the journey we've been on since, is I think we possibly need to to separate out some of the expectations from some of this. I think what's happened with with Gov 2.0, I think what's happened with, um, you know, it's starting to happen with open government, for example, open data is another one, um, is that there are some, you know, operational and cultural issues that government agencies, you know, um, as well as some of the political leaders are grappling with. Well, we've seen and that. then there's the social, societal kind of expectations, capacity, capabilities that there seems to still be a bit of a mismatch between that operational, cultural change, shift, acceptance, adoption, and mm. you know the societal kind of drivers. But it's interesting when you look at the commercial sector, and we all know how slow some of our retailers have been to adopt this stuff. I don't think it's a government issue. Mm. I think this is an Australian issue. I think part is to do with um, population density and geography. We're a very big country with a small population. We don't necessarily get the the when we have ideas, we don't get that instant network effect that you might see in, in larger populations. But yet, James, Australia is well known uh, across the commercial world for being a very fast early adopter of technology. Some technologies, maybe. Um, yeah. I mean, actually, one of the interesting spaces at the moment is around um, work, physical workplace design, 
Um, and and people may have heard of things like activity-based working, which came out from Netherlands. And Australian companies and government here in Canberra, they're starting to look at this. And we are adopting some of those ideas. But when you actually get into more innovative scenarios around some of that workplace idea, then you start to hit barriers. People aren't quite willing to experiment. They want to build on well-trod ground, maybe adapt it to local conditions, but actually being the innovators is another is another issue. Yeah, I, I think Australia is very much more falls into the camp of a fast follower than anything else because we, we, we don't tend to innovate as much as we think we do and the view overseas certainly I get is that Australia isn't seen as that innovative dynamic country except in very small places and normally people are surprised when they find it's Australia innovating and, and that I think is where Australia gets some of the, oh great, you know, people are recognising us for innovations. It's more that people are just saying, oh wow, I didn't expect somewhere like Australia to come up with these things. Uh, but I think what we're seeing is that you know, the gap with the speed of change and with the gap that we have already seen emerging and increasing to emerge, both in politics and the commercial space, between customers and companies. You know, when you see media companies at war with their, their customers, um, I think there is a point at which, if you look historically, that gap grows so much and then there's some sort of major change. Um, normally those things happen in a fairly painful and bloody way. Um, it's very rare for, uh, you know, for, for organisations or nations to actually reconcile those differences in, in a rapid way, in a way that doesn't involve bloodshed and major turmoil. So whether Australia can manage it or not, I just don't know at this point in time, but the gap is definitely widening. And at some point, it will come to such a point where something will need to change. And it, will, and, and it will change, and whether it changes in a, in a sort of a, a measured, managed way or in a less managed way is really going to depend on, on you know, who's leading the country, who's leading the companies at that point in time. But the gap is definitely growing as we've seen the same thing happen overseas. See, I, I think you know, uh, actually the, the game has shifted from federal to state at the moment. I'm seeing more innovate. I mean, I'm, I, I'm based in New South Wales. I, I pay more attention to what happens in New South Wales. Um, we've seen quite massive adoption of cloud and openness to adopting cloud. And that is changing how some of these government agencies function. Um, in terms of you know, collaboration outside of their own agency, um, the adoption of these new tools, it, it is starting to, to change how they work. Um, and things like, um, and I've talked before about what um, Dominic Campbell from the UK is doing, bringing patchwork to Australia. Again, that's happening at a state level because that's a, a tool used by, um, uh, around social care. So it's not a federal um, function to deliver, it's a state function. And the states are now experimenting and trying out these new ways. So I think, I think some of it has shifted to the states, and it's the federal government that needs to now catch up. It's an interesting, Patchwork is an interesting example of UK local government developing something uh, in collaboration with a, a commercial group, FugiGov, and the local government in Australia, in collaboration with the state government, is, is in turn adopting that. But, you know, the part of the story I think is on the UK that we're seeing a big gap here, and we know we struggle with technology startups more generally. It's a really, you know, bad place to be trying to be a startup in this country. Same thing applies to these, um, to Gov2O. What we see in the UK is funding models to really kick start. We're not talking about competitions where you maybe get $500 prize at the end or a bit of mentoring from someone. We're talking maybe £50,000 to help kick start your idea. Serious investment. Yeah. We would not be seeing the benefits of patchwork, or hopefully the benefits of patchwork in this country, if it hadn't been for the different startup funding that Future Guard have received at mm. different stages. Mm. And it's that kind of collaboration, we've not really seen any examples of that. Again, perhaps limited in New South Wales with some of the transport apps. And again, funding uh, for Future Guard from a major uh, social innovation uh, organisation in the UK. That again is something that we we don't quite have here. Can I just pick up on something that Craig said before um, about the leadership? which I think is a, you know, a really important issue in this conversation. Um, we did quite an extensive survey on these issues last year across government, across civil society, across citizens, um, just to try and get a bit of a snapshot of where people were at, what they were thinking, what kind of terminology made sense or didn't make sense, and, and what they felt some of the barriers and conditions were for, for this stuff being, um, you know, being more pervasive and so on. And the big thing that came out consistently across every single sector, uh, you know, no matter which way you sliced and diced the data, was unequivocal leadership, whether it be from civil society leadership, whether it be from political leadership, whether it be from organisational leadership. 
um, was something that was felt to be the single biggest barrier to this really moving ahead. And certainly, from a practical point of view, you know, we in the work that we do, we experience that all the time. That you have really enthusiastic, motivated, mobilised practitioners on one side, and you have mobilised, motivated, you know, noisy um, citizens on the other. And you seem to have this leadership, you know, level that um, is, you know, either unaware, reluctant. We had someone in an earlier session say that, you know. They have a, a, a manager who just says, I don't even know what that is. Um, so, you know, this, even though we can kind of go back to the old aphorisms of, oh, you know, we need more awareness and we need more education and so on, and that seems to be, you know, almost um, dismissively talked about, it's still very much a reality. I, w I was actually at a conference, well, I was chairing a conference yesterday, and uh, one of the panellists uh, there, uh, Darren Whitelaw, who a lot of people will know in, in this sort of space, uh, one of his comments was uh, that. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, public servants and leaders more generally have to stop wearing uh, their ignorance of technology as a badge of honour. And I think one of the things that we still see is that uh, we have a Luddite culture in Australia. We love looking at being early adopters and, and fast followers and so forth. But when a lot of it comes down to it, we still encounter a number of people in leadership roles who actually... Uh, who actually take pride in the fact that they don't touch any of the mechanical stuff, that they don't know how it works, that they just press a button and things happen, and when something breaks, they go to somebody else to fix it. And I think that actually overcoming some of that and actually having people in those sort of roles, and I did uh, interview uh, an MP a couple of weeks ago, which will be in my blog shortly, who was saying that there's a small but growing number of MPs who are actually either come out of the IT industry or who are tech savvy, and they are already conducting regular meetings up at Parliament House. And I think that kind of core, that sort of skill coming through, means that they think about uh, these technologies in a very different way. They think about how to apply it in a very different way. And I think that is, is hopefully where some of the leadership will come from in the future. So what can we learn from the last five years of the open government? Sorry. <laughs> Start again. There'll be an edit back, back, back in the studio. <laughs> What can we learn from the Gov 2.0 movement of the last five years um, that can be a lesson for the journey towards open government, which seems to be getting up ahead of steam if you think of open data as essentially part of that open government movement? I, I think, you know, one of the lessons for me out of the Gov 2.0 task force process was that we stopped. You know, I think this goes back to some of this vision point, is that, if you, and, and we actually see this across again, not just in government, the corporate sector, you know, if you want to ha turn your organisation into a digital organisation, a, you know, a, a, an organisation that's engaged with its, its stakeholders, you've got to have people in leadership positions who are champions, but they've also got to, they've got to put some skin in the game. And they've got to ha employ people at the right level to champion what needs to be done. And I think that's the big, probably the big thing about the Government Job Task Force. It came to an end and we sort of said, job done, business as usual. Yeah, uh, something I, I talk about a fair bit is, is a lot of this is also around change management. And, and this is a, you know, the idea of moving towards using technology in new ways and uh, transforming the way organisations do business and the way communities operate is a major transformation. You need to bring people along with you. And that's a change management process. And there, there hasn't been adequate change management based around Government 2.0. But, but uh, can I jump in on, on that one, Craig, and argue that... Um Mark Zuckerberg didn't change management uh, almost a billion people to successfully create Facebook. Uh, change management actually implies, uh, it isn't always true, but it implies a central uh, initiative to bring people along. Uh, the social era is actually something at its best that's a lot flatter, uh, where people participate in something that, you know, in a platform that's desirable to them. Is it's, that it's, part of the challenge that government tends to do too, rather than rather than deliver an open and engaging space? Well, it's it's flatter, but it's not flat. We still have hierarchies. We still need to operate uh, a whole set of things that work quite well in hierarchies. Like you know, for all you know, the, the bad things said about hierarchies, at the end of the day, they deliver us a lot of the outcomes that we're looking for. So I don't see them going away anytime soon. 
So when you've got a hierarchy, you have to bring that hierarchy with you. And that can become very, very powerful, because once you've got the hierarchy working with you, you can make very fast and very large transformations quite quickly. The difficulty is actually the very big ships to turn around. Um, as Microsoft found, you know, and as Bill Gates did a wonderful job in turning Microsoft around when they entered the internet era. Yeah. Um, and, all, and we need that kind of sustained, deep leadership from organisations uh, in government and in, uh, and in enterprises to basically not only say, here's a brand new thing, here it is, let's do six months, fantastic, let's put a couple of things in yeah. place and then you, uh, your small team can now handle all of that and we're not going to throw any more resources at it for the next four years. It's actually about saying we are making a long-term commitment to this, we are going to continue driving this, it's going to get continued, appropriate funding, and our yep. goal is that this is going to transform yep. how we operate. Okay. We've got time just for two questions if there's anyone in the audience that would like to come up here and ask a question. Anyone? Otherwise, we'll... No, anyone? Um, Craig, you touched on the, uh, the Luddite phenomenon in senior management. There's another aspect to the whole Gov2 thing, and that is um, public servants on social media in their own rights. There have been some highly publicised cases recently where some public servants did some very dumb things and it cost them their jobs. But there's um, a bit of a grey area. Uh, below that that bar, and I'm wondering what you're seeing of exploring um, that boundary for public servants who are actually active on social media and perhaps political about it as well. Yeah, I, I, I'm very concerned about this situation at the moment um, because the current guidelines at um, at federal level basically state that a public servant not only isn't allowed to comment on their area of work, which I think is perfectly reasonable, or comment about the department, because I think that's standard for anyone employed by any organisation, is if you don't like the organisation you work for, change jobs, um, or, or at least complain internally. But they've actually broadened it to say you're not allowed to comment on any policy uh, by the federal government or by any member of parliament of any party. And that becomes really problematic because it shuts down the ability for them to actually uh, actually consult on policy matters or actually express viewpoints where they are the experts in these matters. And I have seen a real shutting down of conversation by the majority of public servants uh, who were starting to talk on social. Um, I just wanted to that. I think there's, a, a, again, a transitional period where we're going to have these problems. But I, let's not get too focused on that part because that's just one part of Gov2O. It's, it's an issue for people. It does sound, yeah. though, that Gov2O has become equated with the problems of what you might call mainstream social media, Twitter, Facebook, for government. Uh, and it seems as if people are kind of investing their energy, uh, their positive energy, in discussions around open data and open government now. Would you agree with that? Oh, I, open data is a fairly safe area for governments to go into because they're releasing data that's reasonably, it's, it's, it's been vetted, it's been checked, it's, it doesn't cause any problems for anyone. It's much simpler for governments to do that than to deal with massive scale online engagement with citizens where citizens say things to them that they don't want to hear. So, or where citizens actually enact things and create things. Um, so yeah, open data definitely is a safe harbour for government and I do worry it uh, takes the whole train off course. Which is really interesting, New South Wales, they're rolling out new smart cards for travel systems that people in ACT might not have heard about this, the Opal card. And someone, a citizen has put up a website that looks at the new pricing structure. And obviously, New South Wales state government isn't too happy about this because it's not official information and it's sort of suggesting that people might, it might cost people more money. My argument was, well, yeah, the government could have put that data out there in the first place and used it to engage the population. They didn't. They sort of followed that old model. And I think it's interesting as Craig was saying, yeah, open data is seen as a safe area except for those exceptions where that data is not safe and then they don't do it. And I, just to kind of close off on that, you know, that's certainly something that we're observing too, which is this situation of, you know, in Gov2O times, social media being, you know, a main focus for people, there was a lot of discussion about the why not, I can't, here's why you can't, all of the reasons why not. 
And we're seeing a lot of the same kind of discussion happening around the open data um, area as well. Whereas, again, open government is a much broader conversation than that, but open data seems to be the, the common place to, for a lot of agencies in particular to start. And the conversation always starts with the why not. I can't, how can I get away from, you know, out of not, not you know, releasing data. So I worry that the, the lessons from the Gov 2.0 time through to the Open Gov time is the same lesson repeating again, starting with the stuff that is easy to say, no, I can't do. And that would be a surprise for all of us that history repeats. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to, to thank uh, Craig Tomler, Alison Warner and James Dello and uh, our audience participants. And to remind our listeners that for links that what we've been talking about, the references, visit the episode page at gov20radio.com. Until next time, bye for now. That's the podcast. Thanks, everyone.